cool. All right, so what we're gonna do is you go to Ahrefs. Let's cancel out of this. Go to Ahrefs, um, and when you do it, you'll come to this home page. Joseph and I, our guest speaker, could talk about Ahrefs just all day. <laughs> we love it so much. So first thing, go to Keywords Explorer. Next thing, um, whatever niche you've selected, whatever website you're working with, just think of like, just think of two to 10 keywords that are interesting to you. So um, Max, let's do this for saltwater tanks. So I'll put in salt, saltwater tanks. Can you think of any other keywords in the niche that are close by to that? Um, Reef tank, love it. Cool. Um, okay, yeah, let's just do saltwater tanks and reef tank. You can put more in if you want, but yeah. So then you press search. It brings you to this screen, and we've got both of these keywords. So reef tank is a 30 keyword difficulty. Saltwater tanks is 43. So both of those are kind of <laughs> tricky. What we go, where we go from here though, is click on related terms, and it'll show you just a massive list of all the keywords that are close by to these. Um, and in there, you'll be able to find similar keywords that are a lot easier to, to hunt. Red Sea. <laughs> so you can see that we've got we've got almost seventeen hundred words here. Um, but Red Sea, saltwater fish, a lot of these are kind of tricky. So what we're going to do next is click on this keyword difficulty and apply a max keyword difficulty of 10. 10 is just kind of an arbitrary number. But for a new website where you don't have a lot to compete with, it's usually a good starter point. So we're going to filter that 1,600 down. So it only shows us 10. So we've got 364 keywords. So for your assignment, what you do now is go down this list and start clicking on the ones that would be good for your website to target. Um, so let's just start at the top. Live Aquaria. I don't know what that is. It's a website that sells quotes. Okay, so it's another company. Yeah, probably. Not a good keyword for our company to go for right off the bat. <laughs> Red Sea Aquarium. <laughs> I'm guessing that's not either. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Red Sea Twink Tanks. Aquarium Wholesale. Red Reef. 55-gallon saltwater tank. Oh, interesting. Look at that. It's only a two-keyword difficulty, and it has 500 search volume. Yeah, who remembers? What what is keyword difficulty or what governs it primarily? Yeah, Ben. How much competition there is to like get on their results whatever. Exactly. Yep. Mostly measured by backlinks, how much the other websites are competing for that query, how many backlinks they have. But exactly. Just how difficult it is to rank for that keyword essentially. So Petco, saltwater fish, no, saltwater sump, coral for fish tank. Ooh, that's exactly what you do, Max, right? I love it. Starter saltwater aquarium kit, also what Max does. Saltwater aquarium starter kits, 50-gallon saltwater tank, saltwater versus freshwater aquarium. Interesting. That sounds like it almost could be a blog post, right? Yeah, Ben? So when we're on Amazon and we see the, the title descriptions of products that are like 50 words long, are they just trying to get on like search results? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're trying to, Amazon has its own search engine and learning how to do SEO on Amazon is kind of its own game, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. So as you can see, we just kind of go down this list, saltwater starter kits, and I just check all of them that would be good for my business. Um, and you'll be required to have it at least 20 on your list. And then once you have that, go to here, click on export. 
you can export it as an Excel file, um, as a CSV, I think, however you want to do it. Basically, it'll just be a spreadsheet and it'll show you, I guess we can just do it. So now we click on this. Boom. We have all the information for these keywords and for your weekly seeds, like if you want to post content on your website or optimize, like you know exactly what keywords you should go for. If what I would do if, if, if I were Max and I had this website, I'd create a different page on my website for each one of these keywords. Um, so, yeah, Eric. So that cost per click, that's for like Google ads? Yeah. Yeah, I know that's that's a good note to make for sure. Um, you can't always. Sometimes the cost per click on here is a little bit iffy, but yeah, if it's low on here, it it has a good chance of actually being low. So it's totally worth testing. Love that. So let me show you guys a blog post where I did this, and it's doing really well. <laughs> This is kind of a, a funny query. I have no goals or ambitions in life. <laughs> <laughs> so I was writing for this company that has a to-do app. And um, it was so hard to find keywords, but this is one that I, I found. And I was like, OK, like I can kind of see how this is related to like a, a to-do list app or a productivity app. Let's see if we can kind of tie it in. And it was a really easy keyword. So let's see how it's doing. So this blog post has a monthly site traffic of 300. It has captured 278 keywords. So not too bad, right? <laughs> who, who was asking the other day if blogging is still a viable strategy for marketing? Is that you, Joseph? It's a good question, but this... Hopefully this kind of answers that question that every single month until the end of time, and that's actually just going to grow. Like a couple months ago, this blog post was getting fewer than 100 visits per month. Now it's steadily getting almost 300 every single month. And the way that this helps the website is, first of all, it lifts the whole entire website. So if there's a product page on this website, and this blog post is doing really well. Google is more like, okay, I think I can trust this website because like, look how many people come to it. Look how well this blog post is doing. Let's just show the product page and the homepage to more people. That's the first way it helps. But another way is that um, you scroll down. It's kind of a fun blog post. I actually really enjoyed writing it. <laughs> you may be depressed. But if you go down here, um, there's a part where I'm like, um, a lot of the times the key to becoming motivated, energetic, uh, becoming a motivated, energetic, ambitious person is to start setting goals and just getting started. There's no substitute. And then on this next paragraph, I'm like, consider setting up a rigorous schedule or set of goals for yourself in order to jumpstart your ambition. Downloading a goal and task setting app like To Do Cloud can help you get your life organized. And this just goes right to the product page. So people can read the blog and download it and be like, oh, maybe I will we'll use a productivity app to jumpstart my ambition. <laughs> Is there a way to see like how much like, how much sales that drove? Yeah. 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 I I uh, won't show it now, but if you go in Google Analytics, you can see like how many people clicked on the link. Like how many people came to this blog post and then converted on the website? So that's a good question. And it's a really important metric to have. Annika? Are the highlighted words the key words or why are they highlighted? Good question. Uh, it's an internal link. So just, oh, okay. well, just a link, I should say. So yeah, if you can just click on it and it'll take you to this other page on the website. And I have a few of them. Some of them go to other pages on the website. Some of them go to like YouTube or information about micro. So but that's the power of this keyword list you guys are generating. If you just start going down, 
and start writing those blog posts, you honestly, like you guys are good writers. You're smart. You can totally have blog posts like this and start collecting traffic. So not, I will say it's not like turning on a light switch. Not everyone ranks on this website. There's like three other, or at least two or three other blogs that I wrote that I thought were really good and aren't doing nearly this well. In fact, I think, I think at least two of the three get like zero traffic and it's fine, but <laughs> this one hit. So yeah. Any, any last questions before we turn the time over to Joseph? He's going to review a lot of this stuff and, and hopefully show you a little bit more too, like why, why specific websites win at keywords. Cool. All right. Well, guys, I'm really excited about this guest speaker. This is my friend, Joseph Wilson. Um, he's, yeah, come on up here, Joseph. Hey, guys. Put your hands together for Joseph. <laughs> so Joseph is from Epic Marketing in Draper, where I used to work. Uh, I finished working there, like, last February. But Joseph is the guy who, like, taught me SEO. <laughs> he and he and the other manager like brought me on a year and a half ago or two years ago and they're like read the Moz Beginner's Guide to SEO. Come to work. We're going to show you the back end of Google. I've never <laughs> been the same. So Joseph is honestly one of the best SEOs though like in the state of Utah. He's so Hopefully good. At it. <laughs> and uh, yeah like everything I teach you guys about SEO has been taught to me by Joseph at some point. So I think that this is going to be a really useful lecture. Well, thank you. Um, do you mind if I make some quick comments on some of the stuff you, yeah, you highlighted? Yeah, absolutely. And then when you want to go to your slide, <laughs> I have it right here. So Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to reiterate some of the things that Ryan had mentioned, one of the things I really liked at the very beginning was the difference between sweater and green cashmere sweater. You know, if you were to go to some sort of keyword research tool and put in sweater, it's going to say something crazy, like 60,000 people, 80,000 people are searching for the keyword sweater. But one thing that's really important to keep in mind when looking for keywords, especially with your businesses, is that you want to, you want to consider someone that searches this, what is it that they're looking for and what part of the buyer's journey are they looking for? People are going to search for sweater, but they're not looking to buy a sweater that minute. They're looking to see different kinds of sweaters, different types of sweaters. There's cashmere, there's, there's this, there's that. They're, they're, they're trying to educate themselves on some sort of uh, uh, topic. You know, it's so broad that they're not looking to buy a broad product. If someone types in green cashmere sweater, they're looking to buy a green cashmere sweater. So even if only 40 people search for green cashmere sweater a month, that is an outrageously more valuable keyword to your business because they're actually going to buy something. Now, that's not to say we don't want to rank for the word sweater. That'd be awesome. <laughs> but people aren't, they're probably not going to be converting from the keyword sweater. They're probably going to be educating themselves and they're a little more top funnel. Um, some other stuff I wanted to mention, if you guys are doing keyword research over this next week, a couple really great free resources also would be Answer the Public. Um, you'll know you're on the right site if this dude, if the header is this dude just staring at you. It's, it, <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful site, but the header's a little, a little freaky. Um, but what it does is, uh, I'm sure you've seen you search something on Google and there's the people also ask options. It crawls through those. So you give it a keyword, like aquariums, and then it finds all of the things that people might be asking surrounding aquariums, and those are directly related to searches. So answer the public, answer the public. Yep, fantastic free resource. Um, but let's dive into some SEO stuff. Uh, who's, doing, who's doing coral and aquariums? Doing coral aquarium? That is a great space. I, I, uh, I, I help a friend out that does coral for aquariums. And like, there's very few places on the internet where like, there's a lot of search volume, but not a ton of difficulty. And aquariums and coral is absolutely one of them. Are they in Utah? Yeah, they are. <laughs> no, no, they're in Sandy. But 
awesome space. It's like you can win a lot there. Cool. Well, let's talk about some marketing stuff. So uh, today's conversation is going to be mostly based on site. So what are things that we're going to be doing on our website that's going to increase our SEO opportunities? Uh, Ryan, are we able to send this, slot, this deck out to everybody? Yeah. Cool. So we can send it out afterwards. Um, but so I'll do a little bit of introduction, uh, recap some important SEO terms that we'll need to have down pat for the rest of the conversation. And then we're going to talk about on-site slash technical SEO marketing, specifically four different categories of work that is going to lay the foundation for a successful SEO campaign. So the first one, site structure and navigation. Second one, crawling, rendering, and indexing. Third, thin and duplicate content. And fourth, page speed and user experience. Um, this is kind of, these are, aren't like the most crazy exciting aspects of SEO. I think the fun part is really like diving into keywords and creating cool content and you know, if someone's going to land on this site, how are we going to get them over here? That kind of stuff. But without this foundation, you're not going to wait for anything. So this is kind of just, we got to build the foundation so that you can build the cool stuff. If you don't have the foundation, Google won't even know you exist. So that's what we're going to cover today, the, the kind of core foundation. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Joseph. Hello, everybody. Um, so I started in marketing when I was working at Blue Raven Solar a while ago, like five or six years ago now. Um, I, was sale, I was in sales, I was knocking on doors, it was the middle of the summer and it was awful and it was just, I was just so sad. Um, and I was trying to figure out how can I get sales without having to knock on doors. And I was like, I'll build a website, and then I'll run ads to the website, and I'll tell people why they should buy solar, and it'll be so awesome. So I built the website, I started running ads, and like it took 30 minutes for me to be like, this is so much cooler. <laughs> like, sales is awesome, but it, it was almost instantaneous where I was like, never mind. I, this is so much more fun. I'd, ra I'd rather be building websites, getting traffic to it, building ads. And it was just so much fun. Uh, now, luckily, I, I had been with Blue Raven for a little while, and they were very kind to me. And I told them, I was like, hey, guys, I'm going to be moving into marketing. This is about a year later. I took a bunch of courses. I did some stuff here at the Y. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing marketing. So I went to the, my manager at Blue Raven. I'm like, I'm moving to marketing. It's either going to be here or somewhere else. And they let me start, start into marketing at Blue Raven. I did email. I did SEO. I did a little bit of ads. We had, it was it was a much smaller company back then. Now they're now they're like huge, but uh, it was really great to be able to, to get my to get a broad experience in marketing. Uh, while I was doing that, I found that SEO was my favorite thing. Um, I went to Ninety Seven Floor. They're an agency up in uh, up in Lehigh, uh, where they they specialize in SEO. Um, was there for a little bit, and then now I manage um, our digital marketing offerings at Epic Marketing. Uh, so at Epic, I cover all of our SEO, all of our email, all of our copywriting. Just kind of make sure that it's all going well. So I met Ryan. He was great. <laughs> all right. Uh, here's some of my clients. Um, I don't work with all of these right now. Just over the last few years, some of the more recognizable ones. Probably don't recognize Crowd Storage, but they're the data storage behind all of the Vivint stuff. Uh, Smart Care, they're a pretty big software company that manages daycares, preschools, and whatnot. Quancast is an ad tech company. Um, Abundant, if you've ever looked for a dentist up in Salt Lake County, uh, we're, we're, we're slowly moving down, down to Utah Valley, but they've got, I think, eight locations now. Brilliant Earth, if you've ever looked for a conflict-free engagement ring, you've found some of my stuff. Vasa is probably my biggest client. Uh, we've got 48 locations, I think eight states six or eight states now, six active states moving into eight by the end of the year. But some of my clients, um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a good mix. I have like Vasa is obviously entirely local, you know, trying to get somebody to come to the gym that's in Provo, while something like uh, Quantcast is all about, uh, they, they serve ads. They're an ad tech company. So it's anyone, anywhere. So it's been a lot, a lot of variety. It's been a lot of fun. Okay, 
Um, I don't know entirely exactly how many of these you guys have covered. So does everyone know what a SERP is? Yay, nay? Sir. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> uh, a query. We'll go to query. Crawling. Spider crawling. Indexing. Go with indexing. Cool. Uh, search intent. Sounds like you guys covered that a bit. Ranking factor. Page authority. Awesome. Cool. Um, just a quick question. So with crawling, like if you write a blog post and you're looking for keywords, you don't have to like put them in a certain build. Google just reads those words yep. and then puts it with that. Yep. So Google Spider just go goes through, reads it, anything that's on the HTML. Um, you don't have to put it in anything in a specific field, a specific. There's a lot of there's a lot of SEO plugins out there that'll be like enter your keywords here. It's useless. Doesn't do anything. Um, but yeah, it just reads it. Okay. Any questions on these terms? They're going to be used a lot in the next bit. So. For the ranking factor. Uh huh. Yeah. So Google uses hundreds of, so you'll hear it called the ranking factor or ranking signal, a bunch of different stuff. Google uses hundreds of different indicators to help inform its index. So, um, you know, Google wants you to use the keywords on your page. That would be a ranking factor. It could be helpful if the URL includes some of those keywords. That would be a ranking factor. Google wants your pages to have images because people like images. So that would be a ranking factor. So a ranking factor is anything that Google or any other search engine is using to help inform uh, its ranking index. It's basically like an item on a rubric. Like yeah. If you're like writing an essay for a class, like whatever, whatever items are on the rubric, those are ranking factors for Google. Yeah. Um, there are so many of them. So like, we don't know all of them. Like there, there is no list that Google is publishing, but here is a list of 200 known ranking factors. Now they're not of equal importance. A lot of them are pretty trivial. And it's like, <laughs> like when I'm trying to create good SEO content, I don't have a 200 item checklist, but I have a lot of them. <laughs> So, you know, uh, mobile usability, like most searches done on Google are done on, are done on mobile. So Google wants to deliver a good experience. They want, they want people to click on their results and find exactly what they need in a way that they enjoy using. So having your site be mobile friendly is a ranking factor. That's actually a very, very important one. If you, if you fail on that one, you're going to have a hard time. <laughs> Luckily, if you use like Wix or Shopify, those ones all automatically do it. So yep, not to worry about it. Yeah, it's really only if you're custom coding a, a site that you're going to have to worry about mobile. Uh, if you're custom coding it, like I don't find your developer, make sure it's important to him. But if you're using Wix, if you're using WordPress, a theme, they're all they'll all be very pretty friendly. Cool. Okay, so. Um, you guys have talked recently about keyword research, about content, maybe a little bit of like they ask, you answer, that kind of stuff, right? That would be kind of of like the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of SEO needs. Uh, that would be very top pyramid stuff. Uh, rankability. How good is your content? Does it have a fun, catchy title? Do people want to read it? Do they enjoy reading it? Do they click through? That kind of stuff. The foundation... These aren't, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they're not as crazy fun. They're kind of just, you got to do it stuff. But if you don't do it, the Google spiders will never make it to your page to, write, to, to decide if it's fun and exciting. So we're going to be talking about these three bottom lines, crawlability, indexability, and accessibility. Um, crawlability at the, is at the bottom because it is the absolute first floor has to get done. The, the spiders have to be able to get on your website. They have to be able to navigate your website. And we'll talk on, in a slide in just a second on how you can make sure that they can do that. 
So, so here's some of the stuff we're going to be covering. Robots, smell. We'll go on that. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we're going to be talking about is site structure and navigation. Uh, so a good site structure is the first step in being both user and bot friendly. Um, a poor site structure is difficult to remedy. Uh, when I say difficult to remedy, it's not that you can't fix it, but it's usually like we're, we're revamping pretty significant parts of the site at that point. Um, it's helpful to think about the Google spider as like, I don't know, like a little wally, a little guy, and he's trying to organize all your stuff. All right, so he, he's taking stuff and he's putting and, and he's putting your pages in piles. Now, unfortunately, a lot of us build websites like this guy. So this is going to be the home page, okay? And maybe we have a couple main pages, like services, products, about us, whatever. But quickly, it becomes a mess where it's like, one, this guy doesn't have anything linking to him, and he's not even a landing page. It was a blog post, and you forgot to link it in your, in your menu. Uh, this stuff is so far from the home page. The spider's having to go here, then here, then here, then here, oh, here, here, here. To get to it, it's really far away. It can get lost. You know, one thing to keep in mind with these spiders is that it costs Google money. Like, it's a, it's a little, it's a program on a server running somewhere in California, but it's electricity, uh, it's, it's computing power, it's not infinite, they are, the, and you only have a certain amount of budget. If you're wasting their time, they're not going to just keep giving you chances. If, you're, if your little spider gets lost, at a certain point, Google, Google is going to go, eh, and it's just going to leave, and it's just going to go to a different website. So you have to make sure that we're respecting Google's time and, it's, and your, your crawl budget is what it's called. So a good way to, to fix that is that you want to create what's called a shallow site structure. Okay, So that means the closer that you can get your website, your, your pages to being to the home page, the better. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons for this. One of, the, one of the biggest ones is that your home page holds the majority of your site's linking authority. Uh, when you're getting mentioned by other companies, if other people are linking to you, they frequently link to the home page. The home page is considered the base of your website. And this little guy, like if we're writing about Coral, you know, this one may be, you know, Coral R Us or whatever I don't know, your, 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 your company is called. Coral R Us. <laughs> but, you know, this one we're down here might be some, a, a page about a very specific saltwater neon green coral, right? So it would, it would make sense to house that under, uh, under navigation that's all about saltwater coral. And then, I mean, maybe all coral saltwater. I don't know. <laughs> um, but then this one might be about aquarium equipment. And this one might be about taking care of your water. And then this one might be about transporting coral if you're going to move it from one tank to another. And then underneath it, you would have content that is related to that parent topic. Now, these parent topics can be a little more broad. Uh, this might be a good spot where you put something like sweaters. And then underneath it is green cashmere sweaters, red cashmere sweaters, you know, a variety. And then this one slowly over time in the middle, slowly over time builds up authority as being a sweaters page. Um, but you want to keep it as shallow as possible. If you have it going down super, super deep, spider's going to get lost. It's going to have a hard time. And it's hard for your users. Like if, if, if you ever told your user, hey, to find this page, go to the home page, click on products, click on products for the home, and then once you're in there, click on kitchen products. Then once you're on kitchen products, cl click on refrigerator accessories. And then once you're on, if you send them down this rabbit hole, they're gonna get lost, it's gonna be hard. Shallow is good for both users and for the spiders. So it's very, very important. Um, avoid orphan pages. When you're creating content, if a spider lands on this guy, He's not gonna. He's not gonna have anywhere to go. So you want you, all of your pages need to have internal links pointing to them, which means so a, a good rule of thumb is you have to ask yourself 
how would I get here if I can only click links? If you can answer that, it's not an orphan page and you pass. Um, employ a consistent URL structure. Uh, URLs are, in, are informative to both the user and to the bots. Um, let's see if there's a good example. Okay, so here is Vasa, okay? Because we have a consistent URL structure, Vasa, uh, Google is listing our URL as Vasa, little arrow locations, little arrow Provo. That's really helpful. When people are on Google, there's a higher click-through rate. People know what to expect. It helps inform, oh, I'm looking at location pages specifically on Provo. That's also very helpful to Google. It, it, help, it helps inform Google, what are we doing? Like, what is this page? Um, one of the key kind of SEO things is that Google, ranking well on Google is all about trust. How do, does Google trust this page? And it, it doesn't know, but it can use different things to inform it to where it can slowly build up that trust. Is this a Provo location page for Vasa? Well, it is because it's a part of the URL structure. It has a it has a good internal linking. It's structured well within the site. It's on the page. All of these things are all lining up to say, this is a Provo page. I'm good to go. I'll rank it third. Very exciting. So, okay. Bread breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs are a little hit and miss. Are you guys familiar with breadcrumbs? Breadcrumbs is where on the top of your page, that little line gets bigger and bigger, where it's like, first you were on the home page, then you clicked locations, then you clicked Provo. In the little, the, it's like a little hyperlink on the top of your page that gets bigger as you navigate through the site. They're awesome if you can implement them well. You have to have a great site structure, though. Okay. Um, and then resolve 404s along with unnecessary 301s or, or any 300 redirect. Um, so this means that you're on your site. You don't ever want a link to go to a broken page because a, a spider is going to follow that. It's going to hit it. It's going to be like, oh, this was a terrible experience. It's going to ding you. Google doesn't want to. Google doesn't want to deliver a page to someone that might result in a bad experience for them. So we need to eliminate 404s. Are you guys familiar with 301 redirects or 300, 302s? So uh, a 302 reader, a 301 or a 302 redirect is when a page. Uh, it's, when it, it's when it moves. So you had a page about green cashmere sweaters. You no longer sell green cashmere sweaters for whatever reason. But there's still links on your site to green cashmere sweaters. So what you do is you set up a 301 redirect that says anytime anyone lands on a green cashmere sweater site page, we're actually going to redirect them to just cashmere sweaters, and then they'll be able to see our available options. So it's just a, hey, this page is no longer available. We're going to move it. Um, three or three, 300 redirects are great. They're, off, they're often used. They need to be used. But just don't use them if you don't need to. <laughs> uh, Google, Google is OK with them, but it's just an extra step for, for the spider. So it, it, uh, it wastes crawl budget. Um, and Google doesn't like getting sent all over the place. So they're fine, but just eliminate unnecessary redirects. Okay. Any questions on these guys? Cool. Winning here is all about at the beginning of creating your site, or you can, re you can go back and revisit it, obviously. Organizing how do we want the content on our, on our site to be organized, what makes sense, what is user friendly. It's all about planning ahead. Questions? So if you have a menu bar and a logo that clicks to the home page, you'll always you won't have a logo to Huh? So if you have like a menu bar and like a logo, you can click on it to go back to the home page. You won't ever have that before. Um you can still have an orphan page. Um an orphan page is isn't designated by being able to leave the page, it's by being able to get there. So if there's a menu, you're right that you'll be able to leave the orphan. But if there's nowhere else on the site that points to that page, then if a spider gets there, and there's some other ways that it can get there, 
it gets it gets stuck. It doesn't know where to go, where it doesn't know where to go. Um, but more often than not, it, it never gets there. So orphan is when it doesn't have anything going to it. Cool. Uh, here's a little example of fixing some URL structure as well as site structure. Uh, when I first started working with Avasa, how their how their site worked. Let's just pull it up. Uh, when, when I first started working with them, how their site worked is that their locations page just had a form fill. And it was a, it was a, a zip code. It was put in your zip code and we'll tell you the nearest faucet to you. Now, it, it was this. Now, it, but there wasn't anything underneath it. Uh, now, this is fine. And particularly because we would look at your IP address and we would try to automatically fill in the location nearest to you. That's not always great, especially if you use like VPNs and stuff. But we would try to deliver but without any zip code their nearest location. But then if we couldn't, all, the only thing you could do is you could put in uh, your, your zip code. And like there was a long list of locations somewhere, but like no one really scrolled through it. Um, but it had the problem of, well, now we have these location pages. Okay. And this is going to be a little hard to see. But can you guys can you guys see the uh, URL or is it too tiny? You can zoom in too. I can zoom in. Oh, it doesn't change the URL bar. Try going like this to the on the screen. That's what I usually do. On your or sorry, not on the screen. Just like the old the old fashioned Mac way. Like Oh. Yeah. Oh I don't think it changed the URL still. Could you highlight it, though? Okay, we'll highlight it. Okay, so this is the new URL. Let me get rid of it. So this is what the old URL used to be. It used to be vasafitness.com forward slash location. So if you can't see it right now, it says vasafitness.com forward slash orum. And there's actually two orum gyms, so it has orum 1600 north. Now, on first glance, it's like, all right, this is fine. <laughs> but we had 40 some odd locations at this time. So it was vasafitness.com forward slash Phoenix, forward slash Draper, forward slash Brickyard. Um, and there was no organization to it. They were just kind of standalone pages off of the, off of the homepage. And I had the thought, I was like, well, Google has no idea how these pages relate to one another. Because we're getting to the homepage, you click on locations, and it wants a zip code, and Google is not entering in a bunch of zip codes to try to find your pages. Now, Google was able to find the pages. They were linked elsewhere, but there was no organization in structure. So what we did is we added this guy. Now, honestly, it's not terrible. Like, as far as people go, very few people go on here and click on Utah. They just put in their zip code, or really this guy works 90% of the time, or it just snags it for you. But what we did is we put this little map, and each of these are links, so we went to Utah. So notice the, little, the URL just went from vasafitness.com forward slash locations to vasafitness.com forward slash locations forward slash UT. And now we have a Utah page, and the Utah page now houses all of the gyms in Utah. And then if we go to one of the gyms in Utah, it tacks on American Fork to the end of that old URL. So now we have a structure. We have like, it's like a filing cabinet, right? We have the locations filing cabinet. And then there's eight different shelves in that location. One of them is for Utah. One of them is for Colorado. One of them is for uh, Arizona, right? But then once you open up the Arizona uh, or Utah or whatever shelf, there's now a bunch of folders in there. There's the Draper folder. There's the Brickyard folder, the Provo, the Orem, or Orem 2. Um, so it's very organized. And even though people weren't necessarily going through this, I mean, they can. They can go through it. Um, but it was very, very helpful for Google to be like, here's how everything's organized. Everything has its place. Oh, these are all Utah locations. These are all Arizona locations. And even though we didn't change um, a single thing on the location pages, 
Google trusted us, Google understood what we were delivering, and we saw a nearly 20% increase in organic traffic. It was a huge change. And the location pages are where Vasa gets most of their new memberships online. Um, yeah. Mr. Brand has a comment. It's also kind of cool because now there are more ways that the users can do it. Yeah. If I don't use a VPN, and if I'm not familiar with the web page, I won't put in my zip code. That's a great point. Very much. And I, I guess I might be a little bit you know, fanatical about that. But then <laughs> if, there's, if there's no other way of getting to where I need to go, obviously, browse like this kind of thing, I'll just scroll down and pick the top. Yeah. You don't have to scroll through a giant list. Right. The, the list was just alphabetical too, like which is oh, on one hand helpful because it's like I'm looking for Draper, just got to go to you know, find C and it's right, probably right after. Um, but to have the organization offers different 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 ways, it offers a lot more internal links. There are several different places pointing to American Fork. You know, so you know. Well, one thing that's helpful to know is that Google reads your internal links to inform what the destination is about. So you, you know, Google's reading this link right here and going, oh, this is going to a location page. So we go here, American Fork is a location page in Utah. So even though we didn't change much of anything on, on these location pages, you know, a 20% increase in organic traffic, hundreds of more memberships every single month, you know, if you're talking about 30 bucks a month, you know, that, that, that made a huge difference by adding two pages, a location map and a state page. So when you're creating your own content, your own sites and such, try to organize stuff. Think, think if I had to put this into a filing cabinet, how would I do it? What I'd be looking for, how would I organize it? Okay. So Joseph, um, in the interest of having like a more shallow website, would it ever be a good idea to like, what if you just took out like the locations once, so it just went fasa.com forward slash Utah American Fork rather than locations Utah American Fork? Yeah. Um, you know, I like having everything in folders and having it organized, having a good, a good structure. If you don't want to do that, like if you don't, especially if you find yourself in a position where people are going to having to click four or five times to get somewhere, you can shorten it down and just make sure you have really good internal links, a, a good good spots across the site that are pointing to your pages, informing Google about what it is. Yeah. So, you can take a couple shortcuts. Don't think that you have to go, you know, eight folders down. I, I wouldn't go more than three, you know. Uh, in large part because it's going to get cut off in the Google SERP. And, yeah, and it is a bad experience clicking so many times. But. Question about this, so this uh, how to apply this. Uh, so if you have like a, a, kind of a, a website that's selling a product and there's also a blog, um, would it make sense if the blog has like four main topics, would it make more sense to have in the menu menu blog, or would it make more sense to have like a separate one for the four topics. So they can just go directly there. Yeah. So not have to go there. Yeah. Um, that one, it, like in the SEO world, there's a lot of topics where it's kind of like, it's kind of split. A lot of people really like to have blog subfolders. Um, a lot of people don't care. And they're like, we're going to have a blog section. Um, and we're just going to make sure that everything is organized internally on the links. We're not going to bother about URL. Um, as long as you are consistent and have good internal linking, it's probably not going to matter. Um, I like the folders. They, they keep it really organized. And when you're on the SERP, you can see exactly how you got there. But one little asterisk to that is that you got to keep the folders short. So if you can't keep the folders short, then don't do it. You know, you don't want to have an, an eight letter word, an, an eight letter long word, followed by another eight letter long word, followed by the blog title. Because um, when someone's on the search page, they need to be able to see what they're clicking on. I would never sacrifice that. So after that, you know, as long as you have good internal structure, good internal links, you should be able to get away with it. But does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to do it. None, none of these are a 
you have to do it or you're going to totally fail. But, yeah. um, I have a question just about like um, making the structure better and the working pages. So if, like, say I have my website and then I have like, uh, like investment or something like my, how much my pricing is, is it? Is it not an open page if I have that little like home bar and it says like the investment like straight from the home page or any page that you're on, or is it something that I should put like on a different page? Like here's a little link link to my inquire page or an investment page. So with the investment page, can you get to it from the menu? Then no, that would not be an orphan page. Okay. You can get to it just by clicking. It would be a winner. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I think having other pages that link to it would be only good news. Yeah. But it would not be an orphan page, even with that only one. Okay. Would it ruin your structure like if you had your home page and then you have like your products and you have like buy or learn more? And so if they hit buy, they skip the page, like the product page or it's yeah, no, no, that should, that should be fine. You, you, don't, you don't need to worry about making sure they follow a specific order. Um, just each page needs to have kind of like a home. Yeah, but you can skip it. Cool. Oh, yeah, right here I put the old URL and the new URL. Um, okay, uh, so th this will go back a little bit to some of your comments. So crawling index and rendering and indexing, Google has to be able to get to your pages if you want this to show up on Google. Makes sense. But uh, if pages start getting too far away from the home page, even if they follow a good structure, you'll see that all of these guys are housed around this one. These guys are this one. But as you get down here, we're getting farther and farther away from the home page. That's not a problem, but we just also need to do something to take care of it. Okay? So what do we do? One, we teach Google what we want it to do. We give it a map, and then we can check in on how it's going. So have you guys have you guys looked into the robots files yet? Cool. Robots files are a fun little. I mean, they're pretty simple, but it's kind of fun that they're kind of hidden in plain sight. So Apple.com. Apple gets millions and millions of page hits every single day by people and by robots, whether that robot is owned by Google or whether it's owned by Yahoo or New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. There's a, a lot of companies have little spiders that are crawling the internet and trying to snag things that they want. So we can tell... Let me get rid of this guy. Check that out. Six million... Six million <laughs> visitors to the homepage per month. That's crazy. <laughs> 250 million visits to the website. Anybody here have come close to that? Think about how many people to Yeah. How's low reach? Seriously. No, that's Do that, man. So, one thing that's fun, and most every site you visit will have this. You can go to the home page and then you can tack on forward slash robots.txt. And these are the rules that Apple wants Google, sorry, that Apple wants all of the robots to follow. Um, now, Apple, being a gigantic site that has so many people visiting it, has a lot of rules. Most sites have very few rules. Okay? So let's go to BYU. Okay, BYU, and like, while we all love BYU, they do not have nearly as many people visiting as, at them as Apple does. Okay, look at their rules. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, BYU is missing something on there. Very fun. Um, so the very first thing that you'll notice on Apple's. Who realized it? Oh, wait. Let me put it somewhere. It's on there. So these are all the rules. Uh, you'll notice the little asterisk right there. Asterisk means all robots. Okay? And then as you're going down, it starts making these exceptions. So the rules follow a hierarchy. So 
top means all, and then you can make exceptions as you go down. So Baidu Spider, that's the name of, of Baidu Spider Bot, and they have a different set of rules for Baidu. Now, you guys don't have to do anything crazy to have these set up correctly. All you gotta do is install a good SEO plugin like Yoast. Um, it'll, like, I use Yoast. There's a couple others, like All-in-One SEO. Um, Yoast is my preferred, and it's free. And it will create a robots file for you with the, net, with the couple necessary bits. Um, but one of the things that, that it adds, and it adds it to the robots file, is the second little hidden page, which is a map. Um, so you know we have a, we have this site structure. Sometimes pages get a little far away from the home page. We try to avoid it, but it's not always avoidable. So a good way to a good way to make sure that everything's taken care of is to give Google a map. Now this is not a very good map for us for people. It's it's hardly readable. <laughs> Um, but it's very, very good for robots. Uh, it has exactly what they need and the order that they need them. Again, Yoast will build yours for free, uh, and it'll, it'll tack it on top. And then as you're creating posts, pages, and whatnot, it'll automatically add them to the site now. So it's very helpful. Uh, it'll help you make sure that all of your pages are seen by Google. It'll help you make sure that other robots that land on your site behave appropriately and don't like screw with your server and stuff. They can't. I mean, they the wor worst case scenario for like good behaving bots is that they just ask too much of your server and they just want, I want 4,000 pages right now. And it's like, no, please. <laughs> um, but I would use an app called Yoast uh, is my, uh, would be a good one. Builds the map for free tax it on there. Google checks it automatically. The first page Google checks when they land on any site is the robots file because they're going to follow all the rules. Uh, the second largest uh, spider is the one that uh, Ryan mentioned earlier, Ahrefs, is the second largest spider in the world. But the first place they check is what are the rules while I'm here, give them the rules, and then they go to the map. So you, if you have both of those, it'll mean that the bot doesn't have to wander around your website. Random side note, Nike's robot.txt is great. Is it good? <laughs> should, we, should we check it out? Oh. Okay. By the way, Yoast is a WordPress or a WordPress plugin. So if you have a WordPress site, oh, use that. But there's probably similar <laughs> tools. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great. And they put that in just for us because the little hash means it's a comment and robots aren't going to they're not going to get confused on anything. That's, That's funny. Cool. So this stuff, uh, making sure that your site is accessible to Google is pretty easy. Download a good app. Make sure the rules are here. None of us are going to have anything crazy. If, if you ever have issues where, you know, uh, analytics is like, your site's getting a hit with robots all day long, then you might want to start adding stuff. But then you want a map. Again, it's for robots. And the last bit is Google Search Console. Have you guys talked about Google Search Console? No, we haven't. Google Search Console is a free tool by Google. Um, and it is a little dashboard on the health of your site in Google's index. Um, it is outrageously helpful. And it, it, it's free. Um, just go to Google Search Console. You'll have to connect your website. You'll have to have a tag on it. Um, if There's a, a hundred different ways that you can add your site to Google Search Console. Just find whichever one fits with your, your, your platform, whether it's WordPress or Wix or whatever. Um, but Google Search Console, one, it shows you exactly who, how many people are landing on your site and what search terms they're using to get there. Very helpful information. But then also it gives you coverage reports where it's like, you have 250 URLs on your site, and they're all valid and happy, and it looks like they've gone up over time. Uh, now, if there's warnings, uh, they'll show up here, and if there's issues, they'll show up there, and they'll tell, tell, they'll tell you exactly how to fix it. So Google does not leave us in the dark 
when it comes to making sure that the robot is succeeding on your website. <laughs> so Google Search Console, it's a winner. You don't need to check it every day, but it'll tell you exactly what you need to do to make sure that the robots are happy. Cool, any questions? Cool. Uh, thin and duplicate content. Uh, this is going to be particularly irrelevant if you sell physical products on your website. Anyone can have thin and duplicate content, but I've noticed that it's really prevalent with products. Uh, so thin content, it's a page that has you know, 20 words on it. If you got those pages, you should find a way to just get rid of it. Um, Google's gonna land on that page. It's gonna think, it, it's not gonna rank for anything. Um, you know, find a different place for the 20 words. Um, you don't wanna spend your crawl budget on, you know, a thank you page that you can only find, you know, eight clicks down sort of thing, okay? Uh, duplicate content. This is the one that really hits uh, product pages. So we have a cowboy hat. We have a cowboy hat that's tan and a cowboy hat that's black. All three pages are probably entirely identical except for this one's tan, this one's black. Like the description is probably the same, the, pro like the material, the price, everything is probably exactly the same. Now, if we don't do something about that, Google is going to look at these and go, you have three cowboy hat pages. I wonder which one should rank. And because it's not sure, it'll choose none of them. Um, so what we do is you choose the base one, okay? And then you add a canonical tag. It's, again, something you can do for free in Yoast. Most pages do what they call self-canonical, which means they point to themselves and they say, I am the original. I am, I am the one that's important. But if you have duplicate pages or pages that are really, really similar, you can add a tag that says, no, this is the one that we ought to be looking at. So then when someone types into Google and they go, I want a cowboy hat made by someone in Provo, this page can show up. And it's not, you're not going to be competing against yourself on this black one and this tan one. Uh, you think about Amazon, you know, all the different options. You click on products and stuff. They use canonicals all day long. Um, but if you're having products, especially if they have slight variations like color, you need to be setting up canonicals. So this stuff's pretty simple. Thin content, get rid of it. Duplicate, either get rid of it or uh, tell Google which one is like the original. Okay. Questions? Questions. So for a product selling website um, that has like five different products that look fairly similar, like that's fairly similar description, but maybe a different design or something. Uh-huh. Uh, would it be better to have just one and like one page for them and like show different designs or like different colors or um it's gonna be a judgment call on how different they are. Um so you know like, I have a NASA T-shirt that it's it's the it's the NASA logo, and they took the 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 Van Gogh Starry Night thing and they put it behind the NASA logo. It was really cool. But some of them are have the base color of the T-shirt is blue, others is black, others is white. Those ones, if I owned it, I'd go. These are all the same T-shirt. We're just modifying modifying a little a little thing. We're gonna canonical all of them to the white background. Okay. But a different t-shirt, maybe this one is the NASA logo with the Vincent Van Gogh thing, and this one is a totally different painting background. It's still the NASA logo, but, it, but we're going with a different, a different theme. I would probably leave that one on its own. You know, So it, it's going to be a judgment call on how similar your products are. Um, a good way to tell is to let them compete with each other and see if Google is showing them as different results. If they all get stuck and they never rank for anything, then I would choose a, a, an OG t-shirt, you know, and I would make that one the, the canonical. But this is gonna be a judgment call. Okay, any questions? Okay. Just, you know, just we have about 10 minutes. Cool, cool, cool. 
Um, I've got about five minutes of stuff left and then question. Okay. So the last bit is page, page speed and user experience. There's kind of four little bits to this and we'll talk about two. Fast pages. Google wants, you, wants to deliver fast pages. They gotta be snappy, they gotta load quickly. Um, mobile first. When Google is crawling the internet, they are crawling the mobile version of your website. They are not crawling the desktop version. Now for most of the time, that's not gonna be much of an issue. It's just a formatting change. Some websites have different content on whether it's the desktop or the mobile version. Google only sees the mobile version. Okay, Content structure. We'll talk about this in just a little bit, but you want to have your content organized in a way that it's easy to read and access. And then accessible. If you're not following this, it'll give you a ding in Google Search Console, but you don't want super, super tiny font. You want to be able to read stuff. You know, you don't want... You don't want pink letters on an orange background, you know, uh, make it easy to read and navigate. So we'll talk about page speed real quick. <laughs> page speed is hard to improve. You know, stuff like Wix and, and other you know, built, you know, Wix and Squarespace and stuff, their biggest drawback is that they're slow. And, you know, because they're using a platform that is a, a build your own and it pulls stuff together. They're beautiful and you can pull stuff together overnight and they absolutely can rank well. But if they have drawbacks, it's that they're typically slow, okay? The fastest websites are custom built from some developer that is focusing on creating really efficient code. But they're all, that's also super expensive, so it's just a trade-off. Um, but here's some things that you can do to improve the speed of your website. Custom coding obviously is an option. Limit plugins. Um, so whether that your plugin is, is through uh, Shopify, WordPress, uh, Wix, or any of them, try to use as few as possible. Every single one adds stuff to the load of the page. Uh, limit page size. Uh, it, could be really, it can be really effective to have a really long, really in-depth page. That can be a winner sometimes. But it's also slow. Uh, caching. You can use plugins that when when you visit a site, it, it'll create a, a cached version of that site. So the next time that someone visits it, they don't have to hit your server. It just loads it straight from the browser. Uh, lazy loading. Again, an another plugin where it just loads blocks of your page at once. Again, another, another software, another plugin. Uh, content delivery networks are probably the most popular. They're really, really effective. Uh, so rather than having your website on a single server, it adds your website to four different servers. And then when someone requests your website from Australia, rather than going to the Provo server, it just goes to the Australia server. Um, and like, it makes a difference to not have to go that far, which is crazy, <laughs> but it adds up with how much stuff it has to, has to request from the servers. Um, some tools, these are all free. Uh, GT metrics, uh, you put in a URL, and it'll tell you exactly what's keeping it slow. Lighthouse is from Google. It'll do a really in-depth audit of your site and tell you how it's going. And Google Search Console, it's not the best for page speed, but it'll tell you if there's issues. And it, it'll tell you on which pages, which is nice. So these guys are free. Bunch of plugins. There's so many different options. So you just got to find if you want a free one, if you want to pay, you know, so just, just stuff. Any questions here? Okay, then the last bit is content structure. Uh, you wanna use headers in a way that organizes your content, really similar to an outline. Uh, this is beneficial to both the reader and the search engine. Uh, when, you know, Google, Google can read, but not very well. <laughs> like it's not a person. Uh, so if you can organize it in a way similar to the, the structure that we mentioned earlier, if you can organize it in a way that kind of helps Google along, it's going to help them a lot. Um, and how we do that is through header tags. So on the top of your page, you have an H1. Um, and header tags are, are, are modified in the CMS in the background. But you can put the title, right? And then the H2, you put like a subtopic. And now when Google's looking at this, everything right here, it knows belongs to the first point. And it knows that everything in this and this guy belongs to the sub point. So it helps structure it and it helps Google understand how it's organized. Doing this really well 
is really how you capture snippets. If you guys ever seen snippets, you, you search something and then Google just gives you a paragraph at the top of the SERP. You know, you, t you type how to, uh, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> how, how, to, how to do the, this thing. And then it just gives you a paragraph at the top of the SERP. Those are really valuable and they're usually captured because Google knows exactly where you put the answer. So very helpful. But those are the main you know, site structure, crawling, thin and duplicate content, page speed, user experience. So these guys right here, if you really nail those down, and, and you guys can do it. You guys don't need to hire somebody. Like, you know, the, these little activities will get you most of the way for having a fantastic site structure. Uh, sorry, a fantastic uh, foundation. It'll really cover these bottom bits really well. You don't have to do it every day. It's not, it's not, it's not going to take up hours and hours of your time. And then you can focus on creating great content and ranking for cool stuff. So yeah, that's that. Any questions? Dun, dun, dun. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You have like your, your, your content and you just want to have like a checklist of like easy and impactful ranking factors. Like what are you trying to hit every time? I can mention images. Like are there other things that you're trying to go for? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the number one way, uh, w without having to go through like a, li a, ch a list of items, the number one thing I would do is I would search the term you want to rank for. I would read the top five pieces and then I would identify what type of content are they giving you? How can you match that type of content? So if they're all listicles, you need to make a listicle. If they're all blog posts, you need to make a blog post. If they're all slideshows, you need to make a slideshow. Um, but then you need to ask what's common among them, and then how can you make yours better? Um, so there, is, there are checklists and stuff that I would look, look through. But without tools, without having to do anything crazy, just read the top five results and answer how can you be better than these, and you'll do 90% of the work. So. Um, Ryan will send this out, but they, there's also a little like checklist for the foundations. Um, we just cover stuff we've already talked about, but but if you can send the slide deck out, yeah. But, yeah. Are there any other questions about this stuff or any other SEO items? All right, well, let's give Joseph a hand. Thanks, guys. That's so it. Much, Welcome. Yeah. Yeah, we're at 15, so thanks for coming awesome. today. Thank you. Actually, just, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, how do you get a CDN? Um, do you have to pay for it? Oh, yeah. uh, no, there's great, there's great free ones. Cloud, Cloudflare is my favorite free CDN. Um, it's it's not even like a little guy. It's like the most widely used CDN. What is it called again? Cloudflare. Cloudflare, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, so clap for free and it'll be very helpful. No, that's good. No, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It. Have a great day. Bye bye. Sorry. You're welcome. 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 Thanks. So, so after you typically optimize all that, how long do you feel like it is until you start seeing like results and just traffic conversion the results? Yeah. Um, so that will largely depend on how difficult the keywords are that you're right. targeting. Right. If if it was someone like the coral guy, right. like he could start seeing stuff in a month. Right. Um, you know, yeah. SEO isn't going to be a quick turnaround if you're in anything that's competitive. For sure. 
Um, I start. I, I don't even look at how is the page doing for two months after I posted this. Uh, just because Google doesn't notice that you posted it right away. Um, Google isn't going to start putting it into the top right away. So uh, really easy stuff, a month or two. Most stuff doesn't hit its stride for a couple months after that. So, and that's going to, again, largely depend on backlinks and other stuff you do. To kind of get ball rolling. Okay, cool. A couple months. I mean, like, awesome. Yeah, because I'm just I'm making a bunch of you know, just benchmarks yeah. and just goals yeah. for. I'm working yeah, at the startup doing some digital marketing, and they need. Yeah. Like I mean, our, our analytics are telling the story. I just need to figure out how to kind of absolutely execute. So, no, you, you need to set good expectations for your content. Where, you know, if you look at it three weeks later and it's not moving, yeah. everything could be totally fine. Right. If you look at it four months later and nothing's moving, that would be a problem. Yeah. Now, maybe four months later, it hasn't hit number one, but you need to look at the, the momentum and where it's going. Right. And you can see that in Google Search Console for free. You can see, oh, it was ranking on the fifth page, and then the fourth right. page, then the third page. Right. So just have to keep an eye on it. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. For You're very welcome. Thank